So welcome everyone to another Breslov Woman Inside Judaism event. And tonight we are going inside Safira HaOmer and Lag Omer. And we're going to start with Lag Omer. But first, what I'd like to do is to thank our sponsors, Lisa Posner, the Huggins family, Esther DiVaroli, the Fishman family, and Shulamit Michal Strasberger. Thank you very much for making this program possible. And also, I would like to say that tonight's learning is for a Rafua Shlema for Rachel Bat Sara, Emmanuel Ben Aliza, Rivka Bat Shoshana, Rebecca Bat Frida, Kim Bat Rina, Yosef Ben Gittel, Beryl Ben Tamar, Moshe Pesachia Ben Pesel Sara. And it's dedicated in honor of Etel Bat Esther Slovak. And it's also Le'elui Nishmat, Michoel ben Sinai, Sinai ben Chaim, and Shmuel Pinchas ben Shlomo. And so may all the learning we're going to do tonight with the beautiful, radiant, uplifting Torah of Rebbe Nachman of Breslov, as well as Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, May it be a source of merit for everyone involved. Okay, so Lagba Omer starts tomorrow night at sundown on the 18th of ER. Last year was, of course, everybody knows, a very calamitous tragedy in Mayron, and we're not going to touch on that tonight. Um, I know some of you had questions about that and have contacted me, and you're welcome to call me, email me, whatever, we can talk about it. Uh, the word log is made up of the Hebrew letters Lamed and Gimel. And Lamed is 30 and Gimel is 3, and it's the 33rd day of the Omer. And the Omer means the counting period between the second day of Pesach, which culminates in the 50th day, which is Shavuot. We count 49 days only. Shavuot itself, the 50th day or the 50th gate, we don't need to count. Now, it's quite interesting because this is a, a complicated period with a lot going on. First of all, this is a period of mourning, and we're going to touch on why this is a period of mourning. Excuse me one moment. Sorry. This is a period of mourning, and we, we don't do certain things in mourning, and during the sphera, we don't uh, have weddings. We don't get haircuts for women. It's a question whether you can or not. Um, and we don't listen to music, especially instrumental music. There are, other, um, there are other things as well that people don't do. Some people have the custom to not buy new clothing during this period, to not make a shehechianu during this period, and so on. Now, the first 48 days of this period are said by the tzaddikim, especially the mikubalim, to correspond to the 48 qualities through which we acquire Torah. The 49th day of the Omer, machus sheva machus, machut sheva machut, which we will talk about, hopefully we'll have time at the end to talk a little bit about that. The first 48 days correspond to different aspects of the spherot, and they correspond to different, different personality traits, different character building activities and ideas and concepts, as well, of course, as different Kabbalistic concepts. And through all of these, it is, a said, we, it is said we acquire Torah. What does acquiring Torah mean? Okay, so in, in brief, and a simple explanation would mean that we acquire the merit of attaching ourselves to Hashem and his word, which is, of course, Torah. So it's really a very important 
time. And we can accomplish a lot during this time. Now, what I want to say is that there are many wonderful um, books and teachings and websites that have different as aspects of the days and they discuss them. Whatever one appeals to you is good. I was absolutely wonderfully corrected by someone uh, recently in which I said it's really better to focus on the particular sphera of that week rather than go into all the minutia because we may not be able to really understand what the minutia means and we may be applying it wrong and so on. And by the way, we're going to talk about what all the spirit mean at the end. And she said to me, oh, well, I found something good on her website. It was detailed and it was very helpful to me. And so it was. So I like to be corrected. And she was right. It was very helpful. And, it, and, it, and, and so if you find something, we still have plenty of time left during this period of counting the omer if you find something that's valuable to you jump in grab it and go right ahead and make it your own okay so lapa omer the 33rd day of the omer is said to be the day of one of those 48 qualities of loving righteousness and loving righteous people so it's a day that is involved with the concept of tzedek, righteousness, and the concept of love, ahava. And as we go through, we'll see how these concepts come out during this 33rd day. Okay. So the Talmud says, let's start at the beginning of what Lag Omer is. And I'm going to keep the first part about Rabbi Akiva brief because most of us know the story. The Talmud says that between the Jewish holidays of Pesach and Shavuot, a plague absolutely was decimating the disciples of one of our greatest sages, Rabbi Akiva. And he was the teacher later on of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, for those of you who are waiting for Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And the reason the Talmud says that it was decimating these students was because they didn't act respectfully towards one another. And it is said that 12,000 pairs of Rabbi Akiva's students were felled by this terrible, terrible plague. That's 24,000 students. Now, there's a lot of Kabbalistic meaning behind this, but the upshot is, is that where respect between comrades, friends, wasn't at the highest level that it should have been, this brought about the plague. Today, we're not on that level, although, although there are some Rabbanim that have pointed out that what we've been going through with COVID may be partially because of our disunity between the Jewish people. So it's something that bears thinking about because everything that's happened in the past is absolutely a commentary on the present and the future. Okay, so Lag Baomer, the 33rd day was special. That's when the students stopped dying, Baruch Hashem, okay? And so Lag Baomer became a holiday and because they stopped dying, it carries the theme of Havat Yisrael, loving and respecting one's brothers and sisters, one's Jewish brothers and sisters. So it's a day that we have been under intense, excuse me, somebody's signing in, so I'm going to uh, let them in. We've been under intense scrutiny, spiritual scrutiny from self and from Hashemai. And it's, and it's Sephira is known as a time of, um, it's not necessarily a totally calamitous time, but it's a time of intense possibilities for introspection and correction. So if you've been noticing some up and downs during this time, that could very well be linked to Sephira, as Rebbe Nachman would say, everything that happens during each day of Sephira is a commentary on that day's particular Sephira. So whether we can 
pinpoint exactly what's going on or not, the upshot is during this time, it's an important time for introspection, a time for additional prayer, for saying to Helen, for saying Psalms, and a time to make plenty of hitbot adut, which is talking to Hashem about whatever is on your heart, whatever is on your mind and in your heart, getting it off your chest, as well as returning to Hashem and asking for his help in coming closer to him. And as someone who can tell you that I have been making Hippo to do it a very long time, I need to hear that message more often than you would, would believe because we forget, we get careless, we slack off, we have to stay inspired, we have to inspire each other, and we have to inspire ourselves. Okay, so when I get to, to share this with you and we have conversations about it, I get inspired. So thank you very much. Okay, so when the students stopped dying, Rabbi Akiva had lost his entire Masifta, his entire academy, his entire student body. Can you imagine the loss? It must have been heartrending. So what did he do? As Rabbi Nachman says, you can always start over. He started over again with five students. And these five students were Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and Rabbi Elazar ben Shamua. Five students. That's all he had left. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is also, of course, very central to the celebration of Lag Omer. We're going to concentrate on him for a little bit. So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was a sage, a Tana of the Mishnaic period, okay? And we can find his work everywhere in the Mishnah, the Talmud. We can find his work right now during this time of year. We learn Pirkei Avot, the ethics of the fathers every Shabbat. We find his teachings there. He's everywhere. And his wisdom is everywhere. But... He's most of all known for being the author of the Zohar HaKodesh, the book of radiant holiness or holy radiance or radiance, okay? And he was the first person that was given permission from heaven to reveal the secrets of the Torah. And we call these secrets Kabbalah. Now, most of you have an idea of what Kabbalah is, but I would really like to emphasize that we cannot take Kabbalah out of the Torah because it's like taking anything else out of the Torah. We won't have context and we'll be missing some vital, vital parts, okay? Whether it's Zohar or any of the other Kabbalistic texts. And these vital parts include what we're, what we're learning about when we learn Kabbalah. Because Kabbalah isn't a pie in the sky, intellectual love affair with concepts, although it can be the most beautiful, uplifting concepts and fascinating concepts. Kabbalah is most of all a way of understanding Hashem's presence on earth and a way of making sense of our connection with Hashem. And it can go very deep. I'm, I'm obviously summing it up very simply. And therefore, if we take out all the beautiful uh, teachings of Torah that actually practically show us how to live with the Kabbalah, with the secrets of the Torah, we've missed the point. And I would like to just, as a, as a personal note, I really think that Rebbe Nachman's teachings are really truly applied Kabbalah. When we follow them, when we, when we take his teachings, which are, are really, it's all about practical application. I mean, it might be emotional and spiritual and mental as well as hands-on. What we're doing is we are living and expressing all the secrets of the Torah, not just starting with the Zohar, but 
with all the secrets of Kabbalah. And he and Rebbe Nachman makes what we need to know accessible for us. Now, I'd like to tell the story of the birth of the Zohar. And um, I'm going to actually read a, a translation for you of the story briefly. And here's the story. So it, it's from the Talmud. So it happened once that Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yose, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai were sitting together. And Yehuda ben Gerim was sitting next to them. So there were four of them sitting together. Rabbi Yehuda opened the discussion and he said, how admirable are the deeds of the Romans who basically occupied the land of Israel at that time, okay? He said, throughout the land, they've established marketplaces, bridges, and even bathhouses. So upon hearing Rabbi Yehuda's praise of the Roman occupation, Rabbi Yossi said, um, he said, um, Rabbi Yossi remained silent. And, and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said, listen, everything they built, they built for themselves. Don't kid yourselves. Okay, that's my translation. That's not the literal translation. The Talmud doesn't say don't kid yourselves. He says, they established marketplaces so harlots could walk there. Okay, so there could be prostitution and immorality. They established bathhouses to make themselves physically beautiful. And they established bridges so they could line their pockets with tolls. So what we have here is we have a very sharp and accurate uh, estimation of the actions of the Romans by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And he was, he was absolutely right. Now, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Yehuda ben Gerin, who had been sitting nearby the sages and had been listening, he wasn't a, a great sage himself, he went and he ratted out the rabbis. He gossiped, he talked Lashon Hara, he told his friends, and his friends told others, and eventually this reached the Roman authorities. And when the Roman authorities heard about this conversation, they made a proclamation, a decree, a very frightening decree. They said, Rabbi Yehuda, who praised the Romans, shall be elevated. So they gave him some kind of promotion and awards. Yose, who remained silent, he didn't defend the Romans. He didn't criticize them either. He's going to be exiled to the town of Tsipori. And Shimon, that's our Shimon, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who denigrated the Romans, he's going to be executed. So you see the damage, we find the damage of Lashon Hara everywhere. So Rabbi Shimon and his son Elazar went and they hid themselves in the Bet, Bet Midrash, the study hall. And they hid themselves under a, um, a bench and they hid, and when they came out, for food. So Rabbi Shimon's wife would come and he would bring them bread and water to keep them alive. However, the search by the Romans intensified and it was getting really ugly. And Rabbi Shimon was very concerned that his wife would be tortured to reveal his location. So he made it known that nobody would know his location. And he and his son went and hid in a cave. And a miracle occurred. A carob tree and a wellspring of water were created for them by Hashem. And what they did for the 12 years, which is a very long time they hid in the cave, they studied. And when it was time to, how they studied was they would take off their clothes and bury themselves up to the neck in sand so that they were modest. They weren't studying in the nude. You can't study Hashem's word in the nude. And when it was time for prayers, they would dust themselves off, get dressed, prayed. And then they would take off their clothing again, 
in order that they wouldn't wear out their clothing, which tells us they knew they were going to be in there for quite a while. Okay, Rabbi Shimon knew. So for 12 years, they lived like this, eating carobs, drinking waters, and, you know, people say carobs, very nutritious. I don't know if it can sustain you, but this particular carob plant was miraculous and certainly sustained them, as did the water. After 12 years, Eliyahu Anavi, Elijah the prophet, came along, and he stood at the entrance to the, to the cave and proclaimed, who is going to inform Bar Yochai, the son of Yochai, that Caesar is dead and his decree has been annulled? So Rabbi Shimon and his son came out of the, of the cave. Now, this is, this is quite interesting. When they came out of the cave, they had been at such a high spiritual level for 12 years that the coarse materialism of the world around them was shocking. It was like somebody who has been in a dark room, somebody being exposed to um, flashlight in their face. It was glaring and painful. So first they passed by some people who were plowing a field. And Rabbi Shimon was like, oh no, they, they gave up on eternal life and they got very involved in temporal life and life limited by time, the shortness of life, the blink of an eye, it's over. This is what they're thinking about. They're plowing a field. They could have been eating miraculous carobs and waters like us. Whatever his son saw, whatever Rabbi Shimon's son saw, and, and Rabbi Shimon too, I think, was immediately incinerated. And a, a boss called Heavenly Voice came out and said, have you come out of your cave to destroy my world? This is my creation. It's beautiful. Don't destroy it. Go back into your cave. So they went back for another year. And the reasoning of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was, even in Gehenna, you don't go for more than 12 months. So a year should be enough to cleanse us. Gehenna is, is the um, place where a soul that needs cleansing and correction goes after it leaves this world, but it doesn't last longer than 12 months. So anyway, um, finally, another heavenly voice came down and said, okay, you can leave the cave. So whatever, what, now wherever they went, um, now, Rabbi Shimon's son kept harming with his gaze. And Rabbi Shimon finally said to him, was, and Rabbi Shimon would heal them. Okay. He was, a, he was a great tzaddik. He could heal them. And he gave his son a lecture. He said, my son, you and I hold enough Torah for the whole world. We don't have to hold everybody up to our standard. Okay. This is a very valuable lesson. Now, again, Rabbi Shimon has so many wonderful teachings for us. I would encourage you, if nothing else, to, to learn Pirkei Avot, like we do this time of year. Really beautiful teachings. And what he's saying is, is don't hold other people to your standard, okay? Don't, don't hold other people, don't expect others to be at your standard. And if you're not at someone else's standard, be happy with that and try to grow, okay? So Rabbi Shimon, exhibited a love that we're going to talk about. And this love was a tikkun for the destruction of Rabbi Akiva's students who didn't have so much love and respect for each other. Now, on the Arab Shabbat, when Rabbi Shimon and his son were walking, they saw an old man. And the old man was carrying two bundles of hadassin. And if you've ever been in a Hasidic house on Erev Shabbat during the time of year where Hadassah and myrtle branches are available, you'll see people will have two of them, okay? And this old man was rushing with his two twigs of myrtle. And Rabbi Shimon said, what are they for? And they said, they are an, he said, they are in honor of the Shabbat. And Rabbi Shimon said, but shouldn't one be enough? And the old man said, one is for Zahor, and the other is for Shamor, as the Torah teaches. We should Zachor, we should remember the Shabbat day, and Shamor, we should guard it, we should preserve it, we should really watch out for it. 
And then Rabbi Shimon was able to say, see how precious, beautiful the mitzvot are to the people of Israel. And when they saw this, and when they saw the good in this old man, they developed Yeshu Hadat. They developed peace of mind, contentment. Because when we look good on other people, our minds gain a level of contentment. We gain a measure of contentment. When we look negatively, we can burn them with our eyes, God forbid. And we can have to go back to our caves and work on ourselves. But when we see the good, even if this was a very simple man, and, and Rabbi Shimon was a great sage and sadic, very simple person in his eyes. He was a farmer. He was an old man. He was running around. And all he saw was the beauty in this person's love for the mitzvot. That's how we have to view each other. It's a, it's a really dominant lesson of Lagba Omer, the happiness of Lagba Omer, the joy that you see at the bonfires and everything comes from unity and love. And if you've ever been to Meron and Lagba Omer, or you've been to a bonfire celebration outside of Israel or somewhere else in Israel, you will have experienced people, all types, all backgrounds, dancing together with love and affection and unity. Okay, now, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov teaches that Rabbi Shimon was the tikkun, the correction, as I mentioned before, for Rabbi Akiva's 24,000 students, because they weren't able to attain this true unity, which is a unity, a binding of affection. But Rabbi Shimon would actually say about him and his students, we are bound together with affection. And Rabbi Nachman teaches that their love and attachment to one another, Rabbi Shimon's students and Rabbi Shimon, their love for each other, their respect, their admiration, their ability to see the good in each other, actually sweetened the harsh decrees and brought down tremendous spiritual healing in this world, okay? So much so that Rabbi Shimon's, uh, uh, one of his students, Rabbi Abba, uh, referred to him as the holy lamp because this light, not only the radiance from the Zohar, but the light of love and affection and Ahava Israel that he gave out and taught was illuminating. It illuminated the world. Now, let's shift a little bit to the connection between Rabbi Shimon and Rebbe Nachman. Okay. So there, there is a really fascinating connection. Uh, there is a core soul that begins with Moshe. Rabbein and Moses. And we know that the reincarnation exists in Judaism and souls or aspects of souls will reincarnate into others. And we are taught that there are five special incarnations of a core soul that Moshe Rabbeinu expressed in his time. And these are the five tzaddikim who were reincarnated from each other. Again, it's not an exact reincarnation the way you would think of if you read it, another religion's viewpoint or a secular viewpoint. It's expressions of intense aspects of the soul, and in this case, the core, okay? These five tzaddikim are Moshe, okay, Moshe Rabbeinu, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who was an aspect of Moshe, the holy Ari, the Arizal, Rabbi Luria, the Baal Shem Tov, and Rabbi Nachman. So because Rabbi Nachman is a Gilgul, a, a, a reincarnation of Rashbi, of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, we know there's a very strong connection and a very strong connection to Lag the Omer. Okay, now... 
We call the yard sites a very great tzaddikin, especially those who are associated with Kabbalah. We call their yard sites, the anniversaries of their death, a halula. Okay. So a halula in Aramaic means a festivity or often refers to a wedding. And so we call both the Lag Be'omer celebration, which is also the anniversary of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's death, okay? We call this a halula, just as we call Rabbi Nachman's yard site a halula as well. So you'll listen for it. You'll hear, when you'll hear people speak about a yard site versus a halula, and you'll see who they say has a halula. So it's a very, also, by the way, many Sephardic, uh, tzaddikim use that term for that. Okay. So there is this very profound connection. And it's so profound that the prologue to Lakute Moran, in which Rebbe Nachman speaks about Rabbi Shimon, is very much filled with hints and allusions, uh, allusions, not illusions to this idea of this relationship between them. And Rabbi Shimo says, and, and Rabbi Nachman speaks about this in the prologue. I'm not going to go into tremendous detail, but I will tell you where you can get a copy in case you don't have Le Kate um, uh, Rabbi Nachman teaches that Although at one point at the yeshiva in Yavne, the sages had a very real fear the Torah would not be preserved. The Jews would totally assimilate. They'd totally intermarry and the Torah would be gone. It would be lost. And it was a very uh, realistic fear because the Romans had really, um, really, you know, really destroyed Jewish life in so many ways. We've had so many people trying to destroy the Jewish people and Jewish life. We, we, it's, a, it's truly a miracle we've recovered from it. We can, of course, see the hand of Hashem. So Rebbe Nachman reveals to us that Rebbe Shem, Rabbi Shimon promises that the Torah would not be forgotten. And he alluded to the fact that the Zohar Kodesh, the Zohar, through it, the Jews will be redeemed. The Jews will go out of exile through the Zohar, okay? Now, if you would um, like to see this prologue, I don't know if they've sent it out this year, but uh, Breslov Research Institute at their website, breslov.org, if you search in Lagba Omer, I know they have this free, um, PDF that includes a beautiful prayer by Reb Nussin about Lagba Omer. I would encourage you to get that, as well as the prologue with in Hebrew with a translation and a commentary. So it's really worth getting. If you have, of course, look at Tamar and you can read it for yourself. Now, the Jews would be taken out of the world with this art. What do we see today? What we see today, and we are in the end times, Mashiach's coming very soon, the Geula is on the horizon, we are in the birth pangs of the Mashiach, everybody feels it, the world has gone completely crazy, you don't have to know any Torah to open your eyes and see the world has gone nuts, and it ha has been predicted to be this way, so, so very much so, and yet what we see is a fascination an unusual fascination with the Zohar HaKodesh. Really quite incredible. Now this began not with necessarily a, um, a yeshiva based on Torah or anything like this, but with some people who started their own group and they decided that everybody should read the Zohar. We don't know how the hand of Hashem operates we don't know why he sends certain teachings through certain pathways, but that pathway has helped many, many Jews come back to Hashem. Very unusual. But if we look around, we see this all the time.
And so many people today are interested in the Zohar HaKodesh. For a while, it was wildly popular among non-Jews. I think that that has fallen off a bit because the whole purpose was to bring the Jews back. And because we're the ones that are the agents or at least partially the agents of the change and the redemption of the world. And, and, and we're supposed to be a light unto the nation and we have to have the light of the Zohar as well in order to do that, the light of the Torah, the light of Rebbe Nachman, which I'll speak about. So we see a fascination with the Zohar. And I can tell you that as someone who has really tried and learned from the Zohar here and there, it, it's, it's obtuse. It's very truly difficult to understand. And we think we understand it, but we really don't. There are a lot of beautiful secrets hidden there. Now, remember the Zohar is called a radiance. And remember what I said that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was called by Rabbi Abba. He was called a lamp. Okay. Now, Nachman ben Simcha. That's Rabbi Nachman's name. He's Nachman ben, his father was named Simcha. Okay, we often call him Nachman ben Feig after his mother's name, but his legal halach name is Nachman ben Simcha. And Shimon bar Yochai, that's Aramaic bar. So we take the Hebrew for that, say Shimon ben Yochai. Both of them have the same gematria. They have the same numerical equivalent between the letters, 501. So we know that with gematria, when one idea, one term has a one number and another term has the same number, there's often a relationship between them. Nothing's by accident. So with Rebbe Nachman's applied Zohar, I mentioned before, that's a way of applying Kabbalah, Kabbalistic teachings, and Shimon Bar Yochai Zohar, we are in the process of being redeemed from exile. So just as so many people have embraced the Zohar Kodesh, so many people have embraced Rebbe Nachman of Breslov's teachings. They speak to us in a way that previous generations may not have needed in the same way that we need it today. Okay, now, I would also like to add something. I found something interesting. The Baal Shem Tov, who was the great-grandfather of Rebbe Nachman. Rebbe Nachman was born in his home. God willing, we'll all be able to go to Oman, Ukraine. Again, I really miss uh, doing women's tours there. We'll be able to see where Rebbe Nachman was born. Um, so the Baal Shem Tov sees in the verse referring to the, uh, the Geula, the Exodus um, from Egypt in Shemot, in, in the verse, he says that the, it says that the children of Israel were going out with an upraised arm. And the Baal Shem Tov says in Aramaic, the words an upraised arm are Beresh Gale. And if we range, rearrange the letters, this is another, it's not Gematria, but it's another, it's a wordplay that's very important when we want to understand concepts and see connections. If we rearrange the letters of Beresh, we get Rashbi. Okay, so the first letters for Rashbi is, a, is an acronym for Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So we see that we are going out with a raised arm, and the raised arm is what Shimon Bar Yochai has given us. Now, Rabbi Shimon was a lamp. His Zohar was a radiant emanation of light and illumination. What's Rabbi Nachman? So you've probably seen the flame logo. Many, many, uh, virtually every group in Breslov uses a flame logo. When you go to his gravesite, his, his cover on it usually has a flame on it. And the idea of the flame is because Rebbe Nachman said, my fire will burn until the coming of the Mashiach. So if Rebbe Shimon was a lamp and the Zohar was a radiance, Rebbe Nachman is a raging fire. His teachings, they consume us. 
but they consume us in a good way. They consume us with passion and excitement towards Hashem and towards our yearning for the release from the sufferings of this crazy time we are living through. Okay, one second, somebody, I see people are signing in and I'm missing them. Now, we need the raging fire today. Whereas in the time of Rabbi Shimon, we had the great sages, they needed a lamp, they needed an illumination. Today, we need a fire to see in the dark that we're experiencing. Okay, now, um, the other connection I want to make is it is traditional to light bonfires on Lag Ba Omer in the, in the evening of Lag Ba Omer, the night of Lag Ba Omer. And these commemorate the immense light that Rabbi Shimon introduced into the world with his Zohar HaKodesh which is especially true on the day of his leaving this world, the day he left this world, okay? Which is, again, why this is on his halula as well, his yard site as well. So on the day of his passing, which was Lag Omer, the 33rd day of the Omer, he revealed to his students secrets of the Torah that were incredibly deep, incredibly intense and profound. We have, do not have access to many of them. You know, we have access to some of them. And the uh, Zohar tells us that his house was filled with fire, intense fiery light on the day he left this world. It was so intense that people couldn't even look and to look, they couldn't look at him because he was just so glowing and intense. And we know from stories of many of our tzaddikim, for anybody who's been fortunate enough to see a tzaddik who's very radiant today, of course, we don't see this intense kind of radiance, but we sure do see it. Um, that, that you know that, that when somebody is very holy and if that person is close to going into the next world, a great light comes from them. We, the, the physical temporal world that we spoke about before is falling away and the neshama is going to be free the neshama leaving the body of its tzaddik in some ways rabbi nachman says it's like a light goes out in this world and he himself spoke this way with great love of um uh, uh, levi yitzchak of levi yitzchak of Berdichev. However, at the same time, when a tzaddik leaves this world, and especially the day, the halula, the yard site, the anniversary of him leaving this world, it's a very amazing time because the tzaddik is free from the confines of the physical body, free from the limitations, and he's able to uh, help us in heaven to intercede on our behalf. What does a tzaddik do in heaven? Well, they learn Torah, okay. They pray for us. They're up there praying for us, which is why anybody who's been to the gravesite of a tzaddik knows that there's a very special, special feeling there. And the feeling in my own on Lagba Omer, I have never been there on Lagba Omer. It is my dream. It's really one of my dreams. The feeling is absolutely spectacular. As a matter of fact, during the times of the Soviet Union, even though some people smuggled into uh, Uman for Rosh Hashanah, because we know we go to Rebbe Nachman for Rosh Hashanah, um, most people were unable to get in through the Iron Curtain. And so if they were living in Israel, as many breast lovers do, they would go to Meron to experience Rosh Hashanah, because as I said before, we have this connection of the core soul of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and Rabbi Nachman. Okay. Um, so Maron is where Rabbi Shimon's tomb is. 
Okay, so people go to um, Mero, and I'm just going to tell you a couple of customs, and then we're going to move on to the sphere. We do have time. And the another custom custom is is that three year old boys is when we cut their payout. Okay, when they get their payout, the rest of the hair is cut. The hair isn't cut up until that point. Um, that's when they have their halakha or upshern, depending if you're in Israel, it's, a, it's the halakha. And so they do that by Rabbi Shimon and their special prayers. It's a great celebration. All the little boys who are getting their, their payout, their, the rest of their haircut, they cry. But it's very, very beautiful. Okay. Um, and if anybody's ever been to Sharon, you know how beautiful it is. Okay. And also, um, people shoot bow and arrows. Often children do. Sometimes teenagers do. Usually they have rubber tips. They're not going to really hurt their imitations. And this is a commemoration of something from the Midrash that no rainbow was seen during Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's lifetime. Why? So it's really interesting because we think of rainbows are beautiful things, and they are. However, rainbows first began to appear after Noah's flood. And Hashem made the rainbow as a sign that even though the world deserves to be devastated, he's not going to do it. He sends a rainbow instead. A rainbow is a kind of warning. And in Rabbi Shimon's time, there were no rainbows because his holiness protected the world and his love, as we saw from the story of how he viewed the simple Jew who was carrying the two branches of myrtle for Shabbat. The, the, the spectacular love, that the goodness that he saw in them. This message is expanded upon greatly by Rabbi Nachman in his teaching in Lakate Maran called Asamra. And Asamra is a teaching that's the foundation in, in many ways of Breslau. There are many, many, many hundreds of teachings. They're all valuable. But in brief, to sum up, which is actually something that is actually a highly Kabbalistic teaching, but the simple meaning of the teaching is, is the most valuable to us. Look for the good in other people. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Look for the good in yourself. Give yourself the benefit of the doubt. Doesn't mean you don't have to fix yourself, but love yourself too. Hashem put you in this world. He put you here for a reason. Hashem doesn't make mistakes. Hashem doesn't do one extra thing. Everything Hashem does is perfect. If you are here, you have a mission. You're supposed to be here. Give yourself a little love. Know that you're important. This world couldn't exist without you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Okay. And then there's more to the lesson of Islam where I encourage you to, to learn. There's so much on, on, you can look on my website, breastlovewoman.org. You can look on breastlove.org. You can look at Rabbi Greenbaum's website, azamra.org, and you can find a lot about that lesson. Okay. Um, now, now we're going to go to the uh, Spirit HaOmer. We, we spoke about it in the beginning, and I want to return to it. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a, let's see, a share. Let me make sure this is, okay, those are my notes. Okay, let me see if I can share screen. And I would, um, um, is Esther still here? Esther DiVaroli? Maybe you could tell me if you can see this. Hold on one second. Can you see this? No. No, I can't. Didn't work. Okay, let me try again. Yes, now we saw it, it. It did come up. Can you see it now? No, not right now. Okay. Oh. Mm hmm. Let me see. Why can't I figure this out? You, 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 you had it up. There was a, a picture. Okay. Or or, 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 or maybe that was a picture of Esther de Veroli. That's actually what it was. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now it's come up. Great, thank you. Okay, ladies, don't if you don't mind muting yourselves, just so I can, like, not be. I'm very easily distracted. I don't know why. Okay, one second. So, so let's talk about the sphere. Um, I do want to mention that a few years ago I taught a course based on anatomy of the soul, and I taught it over 
don't remember whether it was six or eight semesters, but it took two years to teach. And we went heavily, heavily into this. And I'm thinking about doing it again. If you're interested, make sure you text me or email me and let me know. Because I have enough people, I'll do it. It's, it's a lot of work, but it's a fantastic uh, subject matter. And I love, I love learning about it and teaching it. So what are the Sphero? Okay, for many of you already know, but some of you don't. So you'll, you'll bear with the introductory um, information. The Sphero are what we would call um, 10 emanations, 10 radiant emanations of Hashem's light. His light is infinite. His or, okay, his light isn't like light the way we think of light. Okay, and these emanations express this light, express Hashem, so to speak, throughout creation. Sometimes we could refer to it as aspects of Hashem, but we must keep in mind that there are no aspects to Hashem. Hashem is one, he's a unity, everything is Hashem. Hashem has no parts, he's indivisible. That's why we say part of the reason why we say Shema every day. Still, Hashem gives us a gift. He gives us a language that can fit with our puny little intellects. And even though this is actually very lofty, but we can all understand the basics. So what we're going to do is I'm going to, I guess I will go through these. No, I won't go through them quickly. I will, I will go through them as we go through them. And remember that we are in Sphira HaOmer, which I spoke about in the beginning, and during this time of the counting seven days of seven weeks, the 49 days, we are actually not dealing with, um, let me see, do I have a pointer of some kind? Oh, I don't know if I have a pointer. We're not dealing with Keter, Chachma, Bina, or Dot, okay? Dot and Keter, you'll see Dot looks funny there. That's because um, when Keter expresses, Dot doesn't express. And when Dot expresses, Keter is hidden. We're not going to go into the upper, th it's really three. They're considered three spheroid. Okay. Those we can say are the mental, intellectual sphero, even though they do have emotional, of course, spiritual, they're all spiritual, but emotional components. What we're going to do is we're going to take a peek at the bottom sphero. And if you just give me one second, I would like to get my, my notes, which I was a very good girl. And I, I typed them up, which is a miracle for me, which means I can read them. So in Lakate Maran, lesson 182, Rebbe Nachman explains something important. He says that all everything that the world speaks about during the Sphira period, the counting of the Omer, throughout the entire period is only about the Sphira, that divine emanation associated with that day. Somebody who has, I guess, Hachma, Bina, and Das, that Dad, would actually be able to recognize this. And sometimes even an ordinary person who has some familiarity can recognize what's going on in their lives and what people are talking about, even what's in the news. It doesn't have to be a Torah conversation. It can be a very mundane conversation is related to the sphere of that day. So throughout the sphere, of, let's see, why don't I have a pointer? How do I get a pointer? Okay. I just don't think I have one. All right, so you'll just have to look and follow. So what we have here is we have, we start with chesed. And I just, for those of you who don't count sphera, and certainly not all women do count, okay? Um, I have the custom to count. I happen to enjoy it very much. Um, we count at night. And what we do is we, count the, the day, the number of the day, and there's prayers and psalms and so on. And then at one point, we say the emanation of the day. So for example, the first day of the Sphira period, which starts the second night of Pesach, the second night of Passover, is Chesed Sheba Chesed, the Chesed aspect of Chesed. And the second night of Sphira is Gevura Sheba Chesed. 
Okay, and the third night is Teferet, Sheba Chesed, and so on. And then the second week, we move to Gevorah, and we start with Chesed, Sheba, Gevorah, the Chesed aspect of Gevorah, then the Gevorah aspect of Gevorah, and so on, so on, so on. Okay, so what I'm going to do is briefly touch on what these are, a little, maybe a little more than an overview, maybe an overview, and then talk about Lagba Omer, which is Hod Sheba Hod. So Chesed is loving kindness. It's giving. It's the right hand. It's the right side of the body in general. We give with the right side. When you give tzedakah, whether you're handing it to a person or you're putting it in a charity box, we give with the right hand. This reinforces this beautiful concept of um, putting the, the right forward, okay? It's loving kindness, and it's related to our... Uh, our, our forefather, Avraham, he was the embodiment of chesed. He opened it. He didn't have doors on his hands. He had them opened on all sides so people could come in. He could talk to them. He could feed them. He could give them hospitality in the desert. And he could talk to them about Hashem. And he would feed them and he would say, don't thank me for your meal. Thank God, because God's the one who created everything. I'm just... I'm just an agent. I'm just serving you what Hashem prepared. And the color of chesed is white and silver. Okay. By the way, I did a color version of this on, um, on uh, Adobe Illustrator, and I messed it up. So that's why it's black and white. This is actually one of the Breslau, from the Breslau Research Institute. I should give them credit for this. Okay. Next, we have Gavura. Okay, Gevura is on the is the left arm. Its colors are red and gold. Okay, it represents restraint and strength and discipline and even judgment. Okay, and Gevura is knowing when to say no. Gavora is if a kid is little kids running into traffic, Gavora is yanking him back and saying no. All right. Every one of us has aspects to our personality of all of these Sephirot. But some people tend to be a little more one Sephira than another. I heard somebody say, and I, I don't remember who it might have been Rabbi Ginsburg, but I don't necessarily want to say that for sure, that the Lubavitcher Rebbe said that he was naturally Gavura, naturally restrained and, and judge, it's even judgmental, not in a bad way, but very making a lot of judgment and very um, to himself, like our forefather Yitzchak. That's why he worked on himself to be so giving to bring out the chesed from him so that he wouldn't be too gavor. It's so interesting. Not everybody is what we think they are from the outside. Okay, we're obviously going to run over and I see that there's somebody has something in chat. Can I get to chat without stopping the screen sharing? Okay. Oh, thank the Breslov Research Institute. Okay, next we get to um, okay, so and Gavor is red and gold, and it's the left side of the body in general and the left hand. Next, we get to Teferet. What is Teferet? Okay, so that's represented by the torso. And Teferet is the confluence, the blending, the harmony of Chesed and Gavor. Why do we need Chesed and Gavor harmonized? So this is represented by our forefather Yaakov, who represents Teferet. And it's this, um, it's this blending of the right amounts of loving kindness and giving and the right amounts of Gavor, the right amount of mercy and the right amount of rational restraint. So for example, you see somebody 
on the street and you want to give your move to give them tzedakah, you have this attribute of chesed. I'm not talking about the, the halachic requirement to do it. You have to just move to give somebody tzedakah and you go to give them and you see that that person has drugs in front of them. Gevura <laughs> will pull you back and to ferret will say to that person, listen, there's a treatment clinic on the next block. Would you like to go there? Would you like me? Here's, here's their card. Let me go. Or you'll go there and you'll get somebody to come and help this person. Okay. Gavur is having that perfect blend of mercy and restraint and good judgment. Okay. Again, this is a very brief. We could spend, we could spend hours on each one. Okay. Um, the color of to ferret is yellow and violet. Okay. Next we have Netzach. Netzach is one of my favorites. I don't know why I like it. So I like them all. Netzach is eternity. Netzach is um, victory. Netzach is the idea that in order for a victory to be truly a victory, in order for someone to truly be a winner, for something to be of a, a, a true victory, it has to be eternal. And therefore, the only true victory is a victory that's aligned with Hashem. Reb Nassim explains that kingdoms come and kingdoms go. Nations come, nations go. Borders change and so on. And what's left? Nothing. All the great lands that were conquered are gone. All the great people are gone. What is victorious? begins with those five students of Rabbi Akiva that we spoke about, the Torah, Hashem, the Jewish people who are thirsty for the Zohar and the Torah, thirsty for all the Torah, all Torah knowledge. So anyway, that's, that's uh, Netzach, and the color of Netzach is light pink. And this is um, Yosef, okay? It, it, I, I mean, I'm sorry, this is... Um, Moshe Rabbeinu, okay, we skip Yosef. There's one way to look at this and to attribute Netzach to Yosef. We don't, we, we go to Moshe Rabbeinu here. Next, we go to Hod, which is Lag Ba'omer. Lag Ba'omer is Hod Sheva Hod, the Hod aspect of Hod. You may have noticed that the poster that I made for this uh, event tonight, this class tonight, is dark pink. That is the color of Hode, okay? Hode is dark pink. Hode represents splendor, majesty, and humility. And it's represented by Aaron HaKohen, Moshe's brother. I'm going to talk about that at the end. Next, we get to Yesod. Yesod is... Um, Yesod is uh, uh, the foundation. Oh, Netzach is the right leg, Hod is the left leg. Yesod is the foundation. And this is the, um, the procreative organs of the human being, male or female. And Yesod also represents spiritual purity. Okay. It represents Kedusha in these areas. And Yesod is represented by Yosef. Why? Yosef is a tzaddik. We always say Yosef a tzaddik. That's how we refer to Yosef, because he was able to withstand the allurements, the seduction of Potiphar's wife. And we say, um, and the Torah says, tzaddik Yesod olam. The tzaddik is the foundation of the world. And a tzaddik represents very much Yesod. And we also speak about Rebbe Nachman in this way, this way of helping all of us see the value and appreciation and beauty and, 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 and really the, the foundational importance of, um, of good, healthy relationships. Then we come to, Mah oh, and that's orange, the color's orange. Then we come to um, Mahut. Mahut, even though it's at the bottom of this, list here. Mahut is um, King David, and Mahut actually is usually represented as the mouth. It could be the feet, but 
but it's also the mouth. It's mainly the mouth. Maku is the um, the expression of the rectification, hopefully the rectification of all the sphero that come out into this world through Mahut. Because it's royalty and sovereignty, that's what Mahut means. Why is Mahut royalty associated with expressing all the um, all the sphero? Because a king in this world, and the king, Hashem is our king, a king in this world uh, is, um, is someone that leads his subjects. He has to have subjects, and then he leads them, and he shows them what's righteous, and he takes care of them. And it's the, once we have rectified, hopefully, over this period of these 49 days, once we've rectified and worked on ourselves and, and, and really figured out what we need to grow in, we are ready for the 50th day, which is Shavuot. We are ready to receive the Torah. So Lagba Omer is a very important part of that. I'm going to explain why. And I know we're running a little late. Um, Lagba Omer is Hod Shavuot. Hod, again, it's dark pink. It's the left leg. It's splendor, majesty, and glory. Hod Shavuot is associated with Aaron Hakov. Okay. What was Aaron's Splendor. What was so splendiferous about him? What was so majestic about him? Um, it's a whole also rep represents humility. In Judaism, anything splendid, anything majestic is automatically, automatically humble. Okay. Not so in other in other places. Okay. The idea is that Arna Cohen, the Medrash tells us something amazing. Arna Cohen is Hod Shabahod and he's Hod because he was happy that his brother Moshe, his little brother, was greater than him. He was happy that his brother was named to be the greatest prophet who ever lived and the redeemer who was going to take the Jews out of Egypt. Can you imagine a big brother? This was total, it wasn't just, it wasn't just selflessness. It wasn't like altruism. It was an absolute positive love for the spiritual greatness of his brother and an appreciation that this was God's will. And this is why the Medrash tells us that because of this attribute, this hod, he is able to wear the Urim Vitumin, the, the name of Hashem that's in the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. Hashem's name, his ineffable name, the name of Hashem we can't say, can be close to Aaron's heart because because he's so humble and has such true splendor and love. And, you know, this is something that Rabbi Nachman teaches in many places. It's such a fantastic lesson, and it's a very difficult one. The lesson is the true expression of Ahava Israel, true Jewish love, is happy when our fellow Jews surpasses us. And you might say, I can be happy for my friends and family. I can be happy when they win the lottery. It's a material thing, I can be happy for them. But can you be happy for them when they surpass us spiritually, when another Jew becomes greater than us? Okay, this is, says Rebbe Nachman, the quintessential true Jewish love. Aaron HaKohen, Oh, have shalom, Verodev shalom. He loved peace. He pursued peace. And the way he did that was being happy for everyone's spiritual growth. It's what Rabbi, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, as we mentioned and talked about before, Rabbi Nachman points out he was the tikkun for Rabbi Nachman, Rabbi Akiva's students, 24,000 of them dying because they didn't love and respect each other enough. Okay, Rabbi Shimon said, but we are able to truly love each other, me and my students, so we're the tikkun. Rabbi Nachman says, it's the tikkun. It's going to bring us, Yishuv Hadas, peace of mind, when we can truly 
appreciate each other, appreciate our differences, and love one another. And this, so many messages of love for Omer, but this truly is perhaps the most important message is to love one another, to love each other, to find unity with each other, to appreciate each other. I'm going to see if I can stop the share, sharing the screen, I'm back. Okay, hello everyone. And, um, and God willing, we will all have a very happy Lagba Omer. I really wanna encourage you, sometimes women don't celebrate it. They're just like, yeah, okay, ho chibahod. Go to a bonfire if you can, okay? And, you know, even if you live far off somewhere, your local Chabad house is going to make a bonfire. If you don't live far off, go to a bonfire, even if it's for a few minutes, experience some of the joy and listen to music and dance because this is when we get a break from all those morning customs. Sephardim very often will stop. It depends. There's many customs. We'll stop and we'll now continue to listen to music for the rest of the Elmer period. Many don't. Some Ashkenaz don't. A few do. Whatever it is, take advantage of this beautiful day of love and sisterhood and brotherhood and be happy and enjoy the day. And I wish you all a very happy love, but Omer. And before we go, are there any questions or comments? If you'd like to ask questions or comments, you can unmute yourself or you can type into the chat. That's fine. Nope. Okay, I don't see any. All right, let's see. Okay, I guess there's no questions or comments. So everybody have a really terrific Lagba Omer. And Please, Hashem, it's a great time for Mashiach to come so we can all experience him with some light and already when we're joyful. Wouldn't that be great? Oh, I hear somebody speaking. And I can't hear you. So why don't you type in chat, whoever's speaking. It's not coming through. I'm going to pause the recording.